Good afternoon and welcome back to Real Estate Live UK. Our programmes are free to attend virtual events run three times a year in February, June and October. The programme brought to you by White Label and our partners and our sponsors. So before we get underway, we'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the organisations that have contributed to an exceptional lineup over these three days. During this week's sessions, places across the UK are showcasing their investment opportunities and industry leading experts from the public and private sectors explore ideas and topical issues related to property. You can view all our sessions, including several happening tomorrow on our website, www.realestatelive.co.uk. And with many of our panels and presentations linked to our key themes for the week, sustainability and biodiversity, inclusive communities and future infrastructure. Right now, we have a panel about London's thriving life sciences sector. And just before we start, I'd like to remind you, the audience, please do feel free to ask questions using Zoom's Q&A function. And now I'm pleased to hand over to our chair for this session, Neelam Patel, who is the CEO of MedCity. Over to you, Neelam. Thank you, Shelley. And good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to chair this session centred around the opportunities that London's growing life science sector creates for London, the UK and, and globally. Um, so before I introduce the panellists, I just want to set the scene a little bit. Uh, we know that London has a booming life science ecosystem. And, and how do we know that? Well, clearly, over the last two years, London and the South East has attracted record breaking investment. And in health tech, London is positioned second after Silicon Valley. Um, and we also know that the demand for space has increased 400% over the last five years. And a, a demand report that MedCity published last year indicated nearly 300,000 square foot is needed in London in the next two years. And that's a conservative estimate based on the 100 or so companies that we surveyed. Um, and we also know from the Office of Life Sciences 2020 report that London and the South East and East of England contain 49% of UK life science employees, generating a total GVA of £2.98 billion. Pounds. So uh, all of that is pretty impressive. Um, and I'm therefore very excited to have a panel of experts that can help us understand how we can maintain this um, impressive performance and grow it as well. Uh, what can we do to attract and retain companies and what key hubs can be focused on boosting economic recovery? Um, so the, the structure of our session today, um, I will introduce the panellists and pose them a, a question uh, and so that they can share their perspectives and then we'll enter into a QA. and a um, So the panellists today, um, uh, starting with Chris Walters, is the Head of UK Life Sciences at JLL, um, Bob Claver, Director of Strategy, Research and Innovation at Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust, Charles Walford, Senior Development Director and Head of Life Sciences at Stanhope. Um, Ambalika Batra, Head of Enterprise and Innovation at St George's. And Stan Theoflu, Director of Blue Gene Technologies Limited. So uh, a great representation across all of our sectors in the ecosystem. So with that, I'd like to kick off um, and ask Chris, what has attracted life science companies to London and where have hubs been created? Thank you, Neelam. Um, I think the, the initial response to that is talent. Um, that's certainly one of the, the biggest driver that we've seen in terms of companies wanting to locate in the London ecosystem. And, and that ecosystem is vast. It makes up over 1,200 companies. Um, we have three of the top 10 global academic institutions centered in London, um, around King's College, UCL and Imperial. And there are, of course, others like Queen Mary that are performing very strongly in this space. Um, we're home to a number of world-class institutions, as you well know, for example, the Francis Crick, which is referenced more so than ever, I think, and, and rightly so, and others like Alan Turing. So you've got this combination between academic strength and research strength, which is sort of pulling companies in, but also enabling those companies to be created in the first instance. And GLL is, is currently working on a report, which we're due to publish very shortly, which is looking at the number of startups that have been created pan UK. Um, and one of the things that we've seen um, in the London context is that between the period of 2016 to 2020, 177 startups have been created. Um, 24 of those have, have been spin out from some of those leading institutions that I referenced earlier. Um, but what's interesting is when you actually start looking at those startups themselves, 
what type of activity they're doing. And you mentioned in the introduction around um, sort of the digital health tech side of the equation. We know that out of that 177, 36% of those startups are in digital health or, or pharma tech. So this convergence of science and technology that seems to be becoming more and more prevalent um, in the industry is, is certainly there to see in the numbers as well. So collectively, all of those things, you know, the academic, the research, the fact that companies are being created, that's attracting mid-sized companies and the larger corporates and some of the biggest, you know, the most high profile um, you could suggest in terms of ones coming to London is MSD at, at Belgrove House. Um, but there's also been in the press even this week that AstraZeneca are, are committing. So it's attracting bigger corporates, the startups um, themselves are being created and, and there's certainly room for, for growth across all three areas, really. Great. Thank you, Chris. So uh, you absolutely talked about the convergence and, uh, you know, the, the the extent of the uh, the expertise that there is in, in the sector. Um, and so next, um, I'd like to ask Bob, actually, to, to talk about Imperial NHS Trust plans to expand, expand their life science offer in London. Bob. Great. Thanks, uh, Neelam. Good afternoon, everybody. And, uh, and great really to build on, on Chris, because I think uh, picking up Chris's point about talent, um, we're uh, one of the biggest trusts in the country. So Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust, we employ uh, almost 15,000 people. We have a very strong partnership with Imperial College. People sometimes get confused and think they're the same organisation. Well, we're not the same organisation, but we're very, very strong partners through something called our Academic Health Science Centre. And we've got three main hospitals. So Charing cross uh, down at the sort of uh, southern part in Hammersmith and Fulham but up at the top of Hammersmith and Fulham uh, the Hammersmith Hospital um, and also St Mary's um, at the north side of Westminster and it's particularly Hammersmith and St Mary's that are just worth a moment's thought about your question. So up at Hammersmith, Hammersmith is um, a hospital that uh, deals with predominantly adults and a lot of uh, complex specialist care and that's really continuing to grow as we're thinking about a system of care in West London for the two and a half million people who live there and there's a fantastic co-location with White City and everything that uh, Imperial College are doing there so the opportunity around translational research we're one of the biggest uh, biomedical research centres uh, in the country and we have very very strong sort of research interest and capability and aspirations and so that partnership across Hammersmith and White City is, is a fantastic area for us. But also importantly, uh, we think we've got a fantastic opportunity in Paddington. So in Paddington, we uh, have to rebuild St Mary's Hospital. One of the big government infrastructure projects of the moment or programmes of the moment is the new hospital programme. So all three of our hospitals are part of this national programme. But uh, in terms of priority uh, timing wise, we absolutely have to get St Mary's rebuilt. Uh, any of you been there will know it's 150 years old and it's falling down and it's no place despite outstanding outcomes for patients. It's no place really to deliver fantastic care on an ongoing basis. We have to sort that out. The opportunity is to redevelop the campus, which is around four hectares, uh, into both an 840 bedded uh, major acute um, hospital, a trauma centre for adults and children, but also to use perhaps over half the land space around a life sciences campus. It builds on what's going on already around Paddington Basin. There are about 10 life sciences organisations there already. And the more work we've been doing around that, we think that's an absolutely fantastic opportunity. It's a brilliantly connected place. And and to Chris's point, that opportunity to have real genuine co-location with clinicians working in a big, busy hospital, academics uh, and industry all together uh, feels like the perfect recipe for life sciences. Thank you, Bob, for articulating uh, those plans and, and absolutely leveraging on the strengths and expertise that you currently have in the campuses to expand out. Sounds um, very, very sensible and very attractive to businesses coming in also. Um, Charles, over to you. What developments need? Uh, what do developments need to offer in order to attract life science companies and their employees? Um, knowing obviously that the great demand that there is for space. Uh, thank you very much, and hello to everybody. Um, well, I think um, in a way, Chris and Bob have um, set the scene quite well. Um, when it comes to um, what do um, developments need to offer. I mean, I think clearly they need to be in the right place. Um, that's a, um, to my mind, that's pretty important. We've mentioned, the others have mentioned um, the importance of being 
close to anchors, these um, universities are doing outstanding research, um, other research institutions like um, Chris has mentioned, the Alan Turing and the Francis Crick, and then teaching hospitals as well. Um, and then, of course, um, the talent word comes up immediately as well, um, being close to talent, um, because they are all the ideas that are coming out of those places. Um, so I think, so that I, I do think there's a sort of, compared to, sorry, to differentiate it from other perhaps real estate products, there's a very, very strong sort of um, proximity. I know some people perhaps don't agree with that, but I think there is. Um, obviously, you need to tend to be in, in urban centres um, with all the amenities and um, the, the connectivity, the culture, lifestyle offer that, again, supports attracting talent. Um, after all, scientists are people too, apparently. <laughs> um, also need the right kind of building. Um, so I think uh, someone mentioned it. Um, there's, you'll hear a lot of talk about lab-enabled um, office space. Um, this is the um, product that these companies um, need. So it's not just an ordinary office. It's an office with a bit more um, potential to be upgraded. Um, so it's in the traditional office sort of spec specification um, is, is quite hard to um, retrofit. Um, it's more suited to more um, build um, you know, ground up developments or some refurbishments or more robust um, buildings. And for example, we are very lucky at White City um, having inherited ex-BBC buildings, um, who are, you know, owner-occupied buildings. They are very robust in terms of their structure, floor to ceiling heights, rise of space, power, and so on. Um, and uh, these are the sort of um, upgrades that you need to be able to offer in order for companies to do their science. Um, you also need to create this ecosystem. It's another word that everyone says. It's already been mentioned, I think, twice today, maybe three times already. Um, and this really is, um, from a landlord's point of view, um, pretty important, uh, you know, in terms of, as I said before, the locational criteria being close to um, the new ideas. You need to then provide accommodation for those new ideas to be sort of commercialised. And, and there's a lot of hand-holding, uh, the very intense um, sort of like incubators, really, um, but not like office co-working spaces, it's much more intense management on behalf of the landlord in terms of facilities provided and um, sort of um, overall program of events and things like that. Um, and also, also in that ecosystem, providing space for the larger corporates who want to be near the smaller guys, um, and then also support organisations, venture capitalists, uh, regulatory organisations, specialist legal people and what have you around to support those overall my fourth need is to create a community. Again, I think the word's been used already. Um, this can apply to both internal and external spaces, depending on your development. Um, in America, they sort of make a lot about the bump factor, the sort of serendipitous meeting of people in communal spaces to swap ideas and something stems from that. So we need to provide more amenity zones internally and externally and auditoriums and meeting rooms and if you like, labs by the hour, perhaps. Um, so I think that's probably what comes to the top of my mind in answering your question. Thank you, Charles. Um, it's a very comprehensive list of ingredients. It sounds, it sounds much easier said than it is to put in practice, I'm sure. Um, so with that, um, and Malika, it, it would be great to hear about St George's experience in working with local businesses and why its offer is so attracted, attractive to SMEs. Thanks, Neelam. Yes, afternoon, everybody. Um, so for those of you who, who might know of um, St George's, you'll probably know that we um, share a rather large footprint right bang in the smack in the middle of um, tooting with St George's University Hospital NHS Trust. Um, so whilst we're one of the smaller universities in London, we have a big impact in terms of healthcare research and education. Uh, we're the only UK university dedicated solely to teaching medicine and uh, healthcare sciences. So whilst our primary focus is on delivering our teaching to generate the next um, uh, generation of healthcare workers, um, 
we're also very proud of our world-class research and knowledge exchange activity. So when we talk about knowledge exchange, we're talking about ways in which our um, the knowledge and expertise that we generate within the university can be shared with other organizations, um, other companies and government uh, bodies. So the most important part of that knowledge exchange activity is that the knowledge or expertise that we share needs to create some sort of impact within the organization that it's shared to. And we see this impact being created the most when we're working with partners in the commercial sector. And that's specifically what, what my team works on. So as well as renting lab space to businesses, um, particularly um, SMEs, we also have more involved relationships with some companies. So to give you an example of the type of work that we do, we have a partnership with a company that's looking to develop a novel diagnostic test for COVID-19. And there's a lot of research that, and development that they can do internally within the company, but it's difficult for them to find patient samples that they can test the kits on, for example. So working with us, they can have access to our specialist facilities to run those tests and establish these long-term relationships with our clinicians and researchers across both the trust and the university who can advise them on their R&D projects going forward. So we've done a big piece of work over the last year to look at what we can offer to commercial businesses, particularly in the local area, and where we can generate the most impact for them and what they actually need from us. And just this week, we've launched an initiative called Open for Business that covers the results of this work. Um, and what we've come to realise is that as a smaller but more specialist university with excellent links to the hospital, we're really well positioned to provide the type of support that uh, commercial partners need, but in particular these SMEs or these startups and scale-ups. They, they need, um, what they've told us is that they need academic partners that are quick and agile enough to move with the timelines of a growing and changing small organisation, but that are reasonably priced and flexible enough so that the work that they do with us can really have an impact on their development as a business. Uh, so to make things easier for companies to access our support, we, um, we, we've launched this Open for Business initiative, but we also have plans to develop some uh, workspace on campus that will provide, that will help make it easier for them to access our lab space and our facilities. So there's lots of exciting things uh, on the horizon with St. George's and lots of interesting ways that we can work uh, with and support the local community as well. That's excellent. Thank you, Amelica. And I'm sure what you said is music to Stan's ears um, uh, because <laughs> Stan is, is next uh, on our panel and uh, Stan represents a startup. And uh, Stan, I, I know that you've mentioned that uh, you, you already have access to talent. It'd be great to hear about that, um, but also your need in terms of, of lab space and um, you know what, what support you feel you need for that. Yes, uh, thank you. Can, uh, am I coming across clearly? Yes, we can hear you. So um, the truth is, yes, uh, there's no shortage of talent in London. And as, a, as an Imperial College alumnus and a recipient of a grant, a proof of concept grant from Imperial College's Synthetic Biology Incubator, um, which was uh, in 2016, I've obviously made a lot of contacts at Imperial College and I had previously when I studied for a PhD um, some years ago. But um, the whole thing is now escalating in terms of the, the number of people uh, wanting to do startups. And there are lots of spin outs from universities, but there is a critical shortage of affordable. Um, small scale lab space for the SME and startup, critical. And I'm not the only person to have noticed this. It's uh, um, a, a very serious problem. So where would I put potential employees? I'm, I'm in receipt of a hundred, my fourth grant, in fact, 100,000 pound grant to do scale up studies here in London. And I have nowhere to, to do this work. And I cannot afford to uh, employ anybody. And by the way, I've been directed by people like MedCity to um, the White City Incubator, and they don't seem to have their plans ready. And I previously inquired of uh, the White City Incubator, and I'm, I'm afraid I have to say that most of these places are unaffordable. So if, if 
uh, 75% of that 90,000 is going to go to rental for the incubator, then I will have very little money to, to actually do any research and employ people as well. So I am in contact with uh, many people at Imperial College who are willing to work and uh, with, with professors who are supporting my uh, re my research and um, my company's um, product. However, I'm not making I haven't made any progress in the last two years. And I believe that there's a huge amount of available space, potentially like um, uh, industrial, light industrial space, and maybe even shopping malls that are going to start closing down because of online shopping. And all these could be converted into um, min not mini labs, but small labs that are um, functional in a way that could serve this growing community in, in life science. But not only life science, you have other, you know, electronics, you have material science, and these could all interact with each other. And you can have a real incubator, a real uh, ecosystem of small uh, spaces. Uh, again, helpfully interacting with the universities, but not totally dependent. Universities are there. They've got facilities and technical know-how to do analysis. That's great if you can access that. But small companies want their own space to, to do their research. And... Of course, um, interact, and potentially there's a way of uh, applying these biotechnologies to improving the environment, for example. You know, so cleaning cleaning the air in London. This could all be developed into the into architecturally into um, into new buildings or um, develop buildings, existing buildings, to ac accommodate these technologies which are being developed for say cleaning the air um, pur purifying you know the air from pollution or whatever uh, using uh, waste waste resources and this was actually on the TV last night how to use waste resources to generate electricity so potential is there it just requires the will and the investment to 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 build on this. And the people are there to do it as well. Unfortunately, I see hundreds and hundreds of office spaces with Wi-Fi and desk space, and it's all very good for the, you know, for the geeks who want to write code. But if you want a lab, you've got to have that space where you've got access to water, um, uh, gases, things like that that you need to use in the lab. And this is not this is not available. I hope that's fairly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stan. And I think you've reinforced, uh, you know, some of the sentiment that I um, stated right at the beginning that there is uh, there is a shortage, um, certainly in the near term. Um, however, I, I also think that there are uh, some initiatives that, that are in place now to try and address some of that shortage. Although um, perhaps it's not fast as, as fast enough for you as as, as you'd like. Um, Stan. Um, but with that, it would be great at this point in time um, just to ask the audience to pose any questions and answers, or questions rather, rather than answers to the panel. Um, and uh, I, I will try my best uh, to actually go through them um, and uh, hopefully engage in, in a discussion. And it, it's it's brilliant to have all of the perspectives here. So, so please do um, indicate any questions for any particular people that you'd like to um, uh, answers from. Um, while the questions come in, though, I do have a, a few of my own. And um, I'd just like to open up. Um, uh, and we had some good examples from Anne Balka as to how uh, St. George is, is working with businesses. Um, I, I, I also want to ask Bob, actually, in terms of the development that you've got planned, um, how do you feel that um, Specialists, specialisms within the sector should be catered for around London because, um, you know, in, in some respects, what Stan has said, his needs are maybe um, indicative of a particular specialism that, that best sits within a part of London. Is, is, is that your experience or, yeah. or not? 
It, it's a great question, Neelam. And in a way, in, in my sort of two, three minutes, I sort of gave a little bit of a flavour of what's going on at Hammersmith White City and the opportunities there. And actually the slightly different opportunity we think that Paddington brings. And I think, I guess, uh, running a big uh, NHS trust, um, our starting point is our patients and their needs and the services that we're providing uh, to look after them. Um, so take the Paddington example. What we're talking about at St Mary's is a major acute hospital. So for people who are acutely ill uh, or acutely injured, so there's going to be lots of services around trauma, around uh, infection, big emergency department, lots of intensive care beds, a pandemic ready hospital, a big focus on neuroscience. So that gives you the sense of the sorts of patients, the sorts of focus, the sorts of clinical and research teams that are going to be based there in Paddington. So Stan and others sort of sitting there listening and thinking, OK, you know, how does my enterprise, how does my idea, how does the direction of travel that I want to take uh, as an SME or a, uh, or a big company fit in with that or not? So for us in Paddington, you know, rapid diagnostics is going to be a really sort of key part around it. We've got a very, very deep and uh, uh, sort of longitudinal data record as well. So again, thinking about the whole piece about real world evidence, um, I think there's a real piece around some of the uh, the, the the sort of real time monitoring, you know, it's one thing learning how monitoring works on a well person who's walking in around in the street, but actually does it stand up to actually when people are really sick and unwell? I can see the future, you know, very much being around uh, doing collaborative research projects with our researchers. Who, you know, we're going to have a hospital here that's going to you're going to be able to do research at every bedside. So it, it's playing that in. Now that's a slightly different flavour to what's going on with our more specialist, perhaps slightly more elective care. Um, up at the Hammersmith site and things like cancer and gene therapy and stuff like that comes into play that might link up much better with um, the sorts of people who might want to be up at White City and linking with some of the academics there particularly strong on engineering and medicine as well so I think there's an interesting piece for us isn't there when we and you're real expert on this at Med City when we talk about life sciences what, what's the flavour of life sciences we're really talking about and I think getting that specificity um, is really key certainly the journey we've been on around this after the last 18 months I think the more specific you can get the more real the conversations become and then they move from conversations to action which is the sort of space we're in at the moment. Great thank you Bob for that really um, comprehensive uh, answer and, and absolutely agree with you about specificity it's much easier to articulate than to uh, incoming businesses what the research propositions might be. Um, there are some great questions actually that have come in on uh, Q&A so I'm just going to pull out um, uh, one particular one actually which I'll ask Chris and Charles to talk to if I may um, and that's relating to the health and um, security health and safety measures needed for life science labs and how would a town centre location fit with such requirements particularly as, as Stan sort of mentioned repurposing perhaps so um, Chris do you want to have a go at that first and, and Charles maybe if you want to add yeah of course I think um, you know I mentioned the MSD move the Belgrove house in, in King's Cross from a from a big corporate I think we will see a lot more occupiers want to be in more urban environments um, because of all the good stuff that we've talked about earlier in terms of the ability for those for that urban context to provide good infrastructure, good transport, good access to amenities, access to talent, etc. Um, so there is that that movement. It's happening now. Um, I think it will. You can see that that's happened already in some more mature markets globally. So if you look at the Boston market, for example. They are converting they're converting office buildings that are as quickly as possible to be to be catering for sort of lab demand and it's it's being done in a very urban environment in different pockets across the city in a similar way to how London is evolving with different hubs. Um, but it is very common in the more mature market of the states. And I think we're starting to see that firsthand in in London. Kings Cross Houston um, certainly is is leading in that regard, as is White City, and there are a number of other emerging hubs that, that are taking place across London. In terms of those additional considerations, I think part of it really depends on the type of activity that that business is doing and how important the security element, for example, needs to be thought through. Is it a bigger corporate that wants to have quite a closed environment, which is only access in and out by their employees or do they want to have a more open innovation type environment where they're encouraging 
the use of collaboration and innovation between different spaces and different companies. Um, you know, that, that latter example is probably becoming more prevalent where you're seeing multi-occupancy buildings catering for the startups as well as the, the fast-paced growth companies. So there are certainly additional considerations in terms of as a developer, as a provider of space, um, which I'm sure Charles will touch on in terms of how you ensure that those companies feel as if they're getting the right access into the building, the right ability to get goods in, goods out, that they where security is needed, they feel like they've got that um, being provided to them, particularly if it's storage areas or, um, um, as I said, sort of goods in, goods out. The health and safety piece um, is obviously important based on the nature of what activity could take place within within a lab type environment. Um, the planning system in in the UK has, I suppose, relaxed to some extent in the way of how we might deliver labs in the context of the use planning um, class where it now sits. So that's definitely a step in in the right direction for anyone who's looking to provide space in traditional um, office buildings, for example. Um, I think it's just going through each of those technical considerations in the mind, taking it from the mind of who the occupier might be. And that's probably the key thing to think about. Great. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Charles, anything more to add from your perspective? Pretty comprehensive answer from Chris, to be honest. Not sure I can add an awful lot more. I mean, I think there was a, a point um, made earlier about um, other types of um, um, real estate being repurposed. Um, I think Stan mentioned shopping centres, and I, I do know of examples of where shopping centres are being considered, especially this one shopping centre in Cambridge, the Grafton Centre, where they've certainly um, looked at um, how they might create, you know, um, laboratory space, affordable laboratory space there. Um, and in, in some respects, it is a very, um, they're very, you know, they're very robust structures and they have got the loading um, issues sort of more, but in a way, already there um, that Chris was talking about, you know, the need, I mean, space basically and lifting and the need to sort of separate gases and liquids from people and store them. Um, they've also got very, um, you know, tall floor to ceiling heights and enabled to get ducting in and, you know, uh, extracts and what have you. So I think there is an interesting sort of re, um, repurposing of some of these assets, um, which is obviously useful in the context of the high street and bringing some interesting uses and vibrancy. But, uh, yeah. Thanks, Charles. Um, so there's another question that's come up actually on uh, on the Q and A, and and it's it's uh, around how London improves its position to track more biotechs to list at home, which is. Um, which is quite a, a broad question, actually, and a multifactorial answer, or lots of answers, I, th I think, that uh, that can be put towards that. Does any of the panel want to have a, a go? And I, I can certainly add a bit at that one. I've got no takers for, for that for that question. Um, well, I mean, I can certainly say what what my thinking is around this. Um, uh, and from a Med City point of view, we we do support uh, business growth from um, largely startup through to scale up companies. Uh, beyond that, there's a number of, of factors that are needed. And I, I think it's a fallacy to think that London can um, uh, aim to grow and have companies that that list purely from from London. Uh, there there has to be uh, a cooperation uh, between the UK as a whole to to grow and build companies because their needs will vary based on what stage they are in terms of um, growth and also what type of company they are. So. Um, it's not a simple answer to that question, and we can certainly take that one offline because it, it, it's a philosophical question more so than a direct question. But thank you to, to James for asking that one. Um, th there have also some chat um, directly to, to Stan, and I'm, I'm sure he's pleased to see that there, there, are, there are some opportunities for him in terms of finding the space, which is excellent. Um, 
Uh, what I'd like to also go to now is, is ask the panel, um, and, and it's quite an interesting uh, question, particularly with the policy environment that we're living in at the moment in terms of how London competes with areas such as Oxford and Cambridge in terms of attracting companies. And I, I, I wonder whether any of the panellists would like to put their perspective forward on, on that one. Um, and I, I might sort of pick on Chris, perhaps, um, and I can add to that as well. Chris. Yeah. So in terms, the question really is how does London compare to those two clusters? Well, I think I think there's certainly room for for opportunity across all three. Um, I mean, as you just touched on, it's important that the Golden Triangle, in the context of the broader UK market, is all working collaboratively together as a you know a UK science power that can compete on the global stage. When we've been looking at um, the market advising both occupiers and also investors and developers that are looking to provide space. One of the key things that we look at, which we've touched on already, is understanding what's driving company creation, growth, and the ability to then retain those companies. And in Cambridge, Oxford, and London, they are diverse clusters in their own right, which have those unique areas of specialism. That might mean that there's a certain type of company can be created in one part of London versus another and a company being more likely to be created in London versus the likes of Cambridge and Oxford. And each one of those markets is showing the same character traits in terms of strong employment growth, an increase in company numbers, an increase in venture capital that's that's going into those markets. And we're seeing companies created and that demand continue to increase in, in real estate terms. So we wouldn't necessarily think that the, um, the house we wouldn't be that London necessarily competes directly in terms of um, London and, and Oxford. I think, uh, sorry, Cambridge and Oxford. I think if you're a, a company that was born in London, I think your probably your preference would be to stay within that ecosystem because that's where your access to um, either the academic institution or the research body that you've been working with was created. And your preference would be to stay. But if you know, we touched on around sort of availability of space if that space isn't available then naturally you need to look to broader markets broader opportunities to try and find a, a home to a place to grow because first and foremost as, as Stan's already touched on you're trying to grow that business um, so there's definitely room for um, for opportunity across all three it's just a question of understanding from a real estate perspective where are you providing that space in the context of of the local market and making sure that you're delivering something that's fit for purpose Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, I, I just want to go into now, there's some interesting chat around um, uh, community here as well. And I, I wonder if I can ask um, Ambalika actually uh, uh, to, to home in a little bit uh, around uh, what uh, your institution is, is doing to, to grow some of the skills um, and uh, community development, because that, that obviously is an area that you're focused on as well. Um, and also then touch on the facilities and equipment that perhaps um, that you're, you're providing. Sure. Yeah. So, so in terms of um, skills, I think one one of the things that we um, that we've recently done is we've uh, joined five uh, other London boroughs and six universities across South London in the Big South London Partnership, which is a, an initiative that's been launched to really um, benefit uh, the economic recovery across um, to benefit and and uh, help economic recovery across uh, South London. And that's really given us an opportunity to um, get involved with further education institutions across South London and really sort of focus all of our resources on our, our very local community. So talking South London rather, rather than London in general. Um, so we offer um, we offer a series of uh, sort of entrepreneur camps for young people. Um, we do a lot of work with local schools and colleges um, really just um and obviously that's alongside all of the work that we do on promoting stem and, and promoting um life sciences as careers and medicine as careers so um we, we do it we do a lot of uh, um a lot of outreach type work in that way um and then i guess in terms of uh facilities i know there have been quite quite a lot of uh questions around um what sort of facilities and equipment are needed um 
uh, for R&D use. Um, so the types of facilities that SMEs um, and other uh, larger uh, companies tend to come to us for are the um, uh, the very specialist facilities like um, high containment laboratories where they might need to work on um, a disease that's highly uh, infectious and so they need to, it to be contained and safe. Um, they might need uh, access to some of the larger, more expensive equipment like imaging equipment, for example. We have a big imaging resource facility. S things that might only be needed for um, a certain piece of work but not necessarily for lots of different bits of their R&D pipeline. Uh, so that's so that's the sort of the sort of work that we tend to do with them. And obviously, as I mentioned before, access to patient samples as well is really is really important for a lot of these SMEs for validation. That that's brilliant, and I I know absolutely that SMEs can't afford equipment, uh, well at least to buy equipment. So certainly that the facility to uh, rent and use uh, not only space but equipment is is a really valuable thing. So thank you for that. Um, I, I just uh, there's a few questions that have come up, and uh, and, I, and I'm going to jump around a bit. So apologise for that. So Bob, in terms of community development and what Ambalika said in in her geography, does that vary based on where you are in London, or do you think the same applies? And and then I I just want to also ask Stan because he's he's talked about Canada, and it'd be quite good just to compare and contrast perhaps his experience in other countries. So thanks, Neelan, very much. And two bits, and really possibly just linking back to the Oxford-Cambridge Golden Triangle piece a bit, and, and, and indeed levelling up. So in lots of ways, and I, I, I know uh, tooting pretty well and uh, spent quite a lot of my training in Whitechapel. And, and uh, you know, London's the, one of the most wonderful cities in the world for so many reasons. And uh, at, at a sort of general level, I think all of our different parts of London have the same sort of balance of, of very, very varied and diverse communities and completely one of who have all sorts of different needs. There are clearly some differences um, and the sort of hyper localisms, really, you know, we really need to sort of try and understand that. Uh, I do, however, think there's a very, very big difference for what's then going on across sort of Oxford and Cambridge. So the extraordinary opportunity that we have in London is our community, you know, the 10 million people who live here. So I'm focused and thinking about the two and a half million people who live in and around our hospitals and, you know, very significant differences in life expectancy and healthy living, uh, you know, talking 14, 15, years today differences in life expectancy and um, so this whole sort of leveling up stuff that gets played out north south um is a, you know clearly very important political piece but we have that massively within london the opportunity here for life sciences so you know I, white city is a really interesting community up there what we're trying to do in Paddington is linked to the top end of uh, Westminster, particularly Church Street, Harrow Road, um, Westbourne, Queen's Park. Now, these wards, as I say, have 13, 14, 15 years less life expectancy. So the opportunity to do at scale the sorts of things that America is talking about that we, we've long done. But I think if we're honest about the NHS, we've done in bits and in pieces. This is a chance to really think about our role as anchor institutions with our communities and partnering up and using life sciences as a key lever for that, I think is very, very exciting. Great. Thank you, Bob. So uh, we've already started to sum up, uh, uh, you know, some of the opportunities that life science gives, not only to the e economy, but also to community and, and health. Um, <clears throat> Stan, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you put in, <clears throat> this is not good for a chair to have a croaky voice. <laughs> excuse me for that. <clears throat> right. Um, uh, excuse me, I think I'm back on. Um, uh, what what you said around skills development in chat, Stan, was, was very interesting. So I, I wonder whether you have experience of, um, you know, the Canadian example that you have um, that, uh, that perhaps we can uh, learn from. Well, I was, I was in Canada for six years and I worked for the National Research Council of Canada who invited me to start up a company. They would help me and we would work together. It didn't work out, but for legal reasons, because I wasn't a Canadian at the time. And, and we came back to Britain anyway, because my home is here. And uh, nevertheless, I stay in touch with the Canadian, um, the network for biosciences. And I get constant emails about Canadian initiatives to take up for SMEs, to take on uh, and SMEs and other companies 
uh, whatever in the biotech field to take on graduates and they will pay for them. Very simple. And London has got more money than all of Canada, as far as I'm concerned. There's no shortage of money in, in, in London. The question is, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do with it? You know, it just doesn't seem to be flying to where we need it. So if we can invest in, in, in these ecosystems and um, then we'll have startups with not spending all our money on rent, I have to say, but actually paying somebody to do a job, training some school leavers or something like that. This can only benefit everybody. And that is a big problem for us, isn't it? Not personally, or not my company. This is something that we have to face as, as, as a community, as a society. We have to get people working and trained. And I feel that this is the way to do it. It starts with small companies and then, then you have this ecosystem. Uh, and of course, the universities cannot just depend on um, you know, AstraZeneca's of the world. You know, they're all good, they're cash cows, if you like, but we're not, startups aren't. There has to be a bit more flexibility and um, uh, it's a two-way thing in the end, you know. Yeah, As they absolutely. Go, they contribute and there's interaction. And by the way, with the universities, it's also a two-way thing. We have some know-how as well, which we pass on to the universities, as I have been doing for the last six years. And now I'm in communication with, well, three or four universities are contacting me to work with me. But um, without, without the space, nothing's going to get done. <laughs> that, 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 that's fair. It's back, it's back to the challenge, uh, Stan. But I think what you've described there is, is an absolutely real example of, of proximity, collaboration, and working across the sector, which really uh, brings um, innovation and, and the sector alive. So um, uh, absolutely. Um, I, I want to go back to the Q&A, if I may. And there, there is a, a question posed about uh, rental and price differentials between retail uses and R&D uses um, and how it fits with landlord expectations um I, i'm going to ask chris if he can respond to that if he if he can yeah i think the um i suppose the, the starting point is in terms of existing retail use and how that compares to r d in terms of the rent that's being paid i mean rent being paid to, to some extent is a function of the cost of the building that's being being developed um or being converted and um the rent that is charged from an economical sense to, to make the overall commercial proposition work. And there certainly is a difference between what um, an existing retailer might pay for a space versus what an R&D user is. Um, but what the R&D user is, is a pretty opaque question. It can come in many different forms, depending on the type of, of business that um, is using that space, whether it's the health tech, digital health, um, community that I referenced earlier in London that might just need a traditional office space or a drug discovery or therapeutics business that needs specialist lab um, equipment and, and infrastructure. So I think understanding the, the nature of the business that you want to provide that real estate solution for is the first question. Um, making sure that um, you can then work through what the cost to provide that space is, because as the panel and those tuning in will know, that's not cheap thing to do, particularly for, for specialist biology or chemistry space and beyond. Um, and then working out how you how you make all of that knit together. And as as Charles said earlier, there certainly is more examples than ever that we've seen in the past 12 months or so in particular, where existing land landlords of of space in asset classes like retail have looked to convert that space to the R&D use few reasons for that. Um, typically, they could be in the right location, um, which is, again, as Charles mentioned earlier, is key. And Stan has certainly alluded to that in terms of being important for business. But then also, technically, those retail type of buildings can work because they have built in facilities and services um, to allow for goods in um, to come in and out, as I mentioned earlier. So there certainly is a price difference. I think what that difference is really depends on the local market and the type of space that you're delivering um, and how landlords are getting comfortable with that, I think, is that we're seeing an increase in the sort of the understanding knowledge of how this market works. 
um, what type of space needs to be provided to make sure it's fit for purpose. Um, and that, that will con constantly improve, I think, as the market matures um, in London and beyond England. I think certainly the, 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 the investor is becoming more savvy and hopefully more in tune with what the occupiers of, of this space need, which is good. Excellent. Thank you, Chris, for that very comprehensive answer. I, I want to now touch around um, clusters and how they can share best practice um, and uh, exchange what's working and, and what's not working across the geography. Um, certainly from where I sit uh, across London, but we see development and development according to specialism, as, as Bob mentioned earlier, which, which is obviously really important. But there are opportunities, I think, that the, the, the clusters clusters can share and I want to ask um, particularly with the conversation that we've had with Bob and Ambalika, Ambalika around their initiatives locally if, if I were to say to both of you uh, you know are, are there immediate thoughts where perhaps um, your particular ge geography share a common interest and, and how how could that work in support of growing more um, opportunities for, for SMEs and the community um, could could you could you give me an answer and then I'd also like to ask Charles that from a developer point of view also working across London regions uh, are there opportunities from your point of view where clusters can be brought together to to, to sort of share practice and, um, uh, and and grow the answer may be no absolutely not and that's absolutely fine but um, <laughs> uh, but I'd like to ask Bob and Umbalika to start with who wants to go first <laughs> I'm happy to, shall I go quickly and pass on? So it's a really good question, Neelam, and I think inherent in your question is a, I think, a bit of a push that we have to get better in and around this stuff. So uh, let's speak for the NHS first. The NHS has had a system for the last 10 years that essentially organisations have been put in competition against each other in terms of for funding. Um, the academic world, that is absolutely the case, and universities in very, very direct competition. Um, that is starting to change. Certainly on the NHS side, we are now, you know, funding increasingly is dependent on genuine collaboration. And it's good to see the academic side starting to come into that place and space as well. And there's a bit of old habits die hard, I suspect, and sort of behaviours and things that people are used to. But I think as we start to look at population health and we start to think, so there's some really interesting work going on across London looking at how do you bring data together of 10 million patients because you want to hit on a global level and make London the most attractive place to come and do life sciences that's the sort of pitch you've got to come up with and I think people recognize and realize that and um, so at a macro level that's where I think about it I think our really interesting case study has been running Hammersmith Hospital up co-located with White City and also thinking really hard about as we redevelop St Mary's how do we do Paddington life sciences and when we been starting to sort of take the user case on it and you know talking to uh, people like Stan and trying to understand okay what is your pathway of development of your product what starts to come out is there may be different times uh, in uh, you know p various SMEs development as companies where they might well want to be based in a place like White City and close in with the engineers and in that sort of space. And there may be times when they're needing or phases where they're needing to do but you know clinical validation work or the like where they'd be way better off coming and having some space in uh, uh, in Paddington and being able to be co-located with everything we're doing at St Mary's. So when we're thinking about the design of this piece, the you know the word flexibility and adaptability feels very, very key here. And I'm sure Chris and uh, Charles and others would, would sort of play into that. So we're really trying to think about it. I was struck by Chris talking earlier about the, you know, the building with a sort of security front door that only, you know, and you can imagine nothing much moves and changes in 10 years. I'm not convinced that's the sort of space we need. I think these spaces need to be open and, and, and people need to be able to say, well, I'm going to come in for a 10 week phase of my uh, research program and come and be base co-located with the clinical teams that actually, but Paddington's quite an expensive place to be. I'm not going to hang around there for, so, that fluidity, that flexibility is really top of our mind in, in, in the planning and design. But maybe I'll pass on to Ambelica, who may, may well have some other thoughts. Yeah, no, I, I completely uh, agree with Bob, actually. I think um, your your point about universities competing with each other is is absolutely true. There's, there's um, 
uh, historically, I mean, universities are competing over students as, as the very classic example, but things are, are changing and collaboration is becoming more and more important and particularly collaboration with, with commercial partners is becoming really key. So I do think that as universities and, and, and uh, hospitals start to open up and become a bit more focused on those commercial interactions and commercial collaborations, we'll will naturally start to grow clusters around us based on our specialisms. And I, I guess actually a good example of that, sorry, is um, is um, the Institute for Cancer Research, um, Dan Sutton. They've opened an innovation centre recently, and I think they're starting to do that. They've really opened up and, um, and, and they're growing quite a nice little cluster around them as well. It's brilliant. Um, Charles, what about from your perspective? Well, I, I was just going to say, and I wanted to say earlier that um, we're kind of new kids on the block here, um, the, the private real estate sector. This is a what we're experiencing in London, especially. It's a sort of new type of demand, and we're trying to wrestle with it all. Um, there are a lot of competing uses for the land in London. I mean, the one thing that is short, <laughs> Stan said there's no shortage of talent. Someone else said there's no shortage of money, but what there is a shortage of is land. Um, and that, I think, is... Uh, a real problem for us trying to deliver for this market you know we know we've got to be a bit visionary you've got to be it's not for the faint-hearted because you know you don't the specification of the building is more than an office building uh, the value end of it is still is a bit opaque at the moment as well so i think um i think in our defense you know we are trying to to be um we're, we're trying to respond to this demand um it's quite tough for a number of reasons, planning as well, um, getting to grips with planning. So we've got a lot of opportunities on the stocks and nothing's of immediately now, which might be causing standards immediate problem. There is no space right now that is the right price and right spec. I think that, you know, from my small knowledge of this, there is there are clearly specialisms. I mean, we hear med tech being a specialism around St. Thomas's, cell and gene therapy around guys, AI and and stuff up with it, Francis, create life science stuff at King's Cross. So I think from our point of view, we're just trying to find a flexible product um, that can accommodate, doesn't really matter what special, specialisms. And, and in terms of clusters and uses between clusters and movement between, I think it's just what um, Bob was saying in terms of um, you may be here, you know, if we could provide a cheap reasonably priced accommodation on a flexible basis that people can do certain things in for a short period of time and move off. That would be one way of, of helping people move around a cluster. But other than that, of course, London's got pretty exceptional public transport system. We're hardly very far from each other anyway. Um, so I would have thought it could all kind of work its, work its magic in that way. Um, so sorry, that's probably not the most brilliant answer, but... Yeah, well, well, thank you, thank you, and thank you for your honesty in in terms of new kids on the block. And, and I, I, you know, I certainly know that you're you're not the only one. I think that the field is so fast moving, um, and the growth rate is so high. Actually, that, that you know we are having all having to reevaluate what our sort of strategy and positioning is on on many of these things. So thank you for that. So in the interest of time, and I'm really sorry if there are other questions that we haven't got to, but I'm sure they'll be followed up um, in due course. I just wanted to. To, to summarise, well, firstly, thank you very much for the engaging discussion that the panellists um, uh, gave us and, and answering the, uh, the, the the sort of quite complicated questions in, in some respect. Uh, I, I think it's clear to say that there is a huge opportunity for life sciences and, and growth in London, uh, and particularly some of the things that we've been talking about is, is that the talent and expertise is, is here, and that is what we've seen and evidenced uh, 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 very clearly from multiple multiple sources and that needs to be embraced and we can't take that for granted and that does require investment and it does require um, as as many of, of you have said today you know the mechanisms by which we can can get graduates or can get school leavers uh, you know onto the the skills ladder um, and it's also important to know, I think, from a development point of view, that many life science companies uh, need, uh, you know, technicians, particularly companies like cell and gene therapy companies, where actually the, the process of manufacturing and being close to hospital sites where they can actually trial and then put 
uh, their top tech vault into practice is so key. And uh, the UK and London in particular is world renowned globally for these for these therapies. And uh, it should be celebrated. We, we need to do all we can to keep these companies here. Um, we, we also did talk about proximity um, and, and specialisms. And that clearly is an opportunity as well. And, and certainly the developments that are going on um, in London uh, across the, the geography will create even more opportunities for SMEs uh, and, and larger companies to come and invest. Um, of course, we can't ignore the challenges, and uh, certainly these have been articulated in the lack of immediate space, uh, which there are initiatives ongoing to try and address that. It's not going to be immediate, but that does require collaboration with other geographies, uh, you know, plain and simple, and that uh, is in place, and certainly organisations like MidCity can facilitate that, and I'm really pleased that the audience are also putting their suggestions in, so <laughs> thank you very much for that. So we've reached the top of the hour, and I want to thank you again for your participation, thank you um, to the panellists, uh, and thank you for the organisers for um, uh, inviting us all to be part of the conversation. Thank, Thank you, Neil. Thank you so much, Neil, and to all of our panel for a Thank great you. discussion Very this morning. Oh, sorry, my, are there other people talking as well? I do apologise. There's more, still more to come from Real Estate Live UK. On our final day tomorrow, we host six varied sessions, and these are on sustainable stadiums, Social value, a session on putting the S in ESG in association with Domino's Group. We joined the London Borough of Barnet, talking about their investment ambitions and opportunities. We're talking about biodiversity net gain in large developments, a session in association with the Building Garden Communities Conference and Network. We're talking about the Africa opportunity, a session in association with the Institute of Directors and the role of the real estate sector in levelling up in the UK is our closing keynote tomorrow afternoon. You can book that and any of tomorrow's sessions by visiting the programme page on our website, realestatelive.co.uk. Thank you once all again for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow or soon.